Alright, this is Art 131 with Wyndham Graves, and today I have ha I have Javier Rivera on to talk about 3D printing, uh, just as a general conversation. Uh, Javier, would you introduce yourself and give us a little of your history and why this is the thing that you do? Yeah, um, hey, so I'm Javier Rivera. Um, I kind of have been doing 3D printing, 3D design for about seven or so years. Um, I was uh, an art major at Florida State University, and um, I had taken three classes, I believe, with Wyndham. And in the first one, we learned a little bit of 3D modeling, um, basic, basic stuff on 3D printing. Um, and I caught on really quick. So yeah. he introduced me to uh, a new software, and I, then I started interning for him at, uh, at Facility for Arts Research. Yep. And that's kind of where I got my, my feet when it comes to 3D printing and 3D modeling. Um, shadowing under Wyndham. Um, so I thank you for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Your stuff putting me in my, it. Putting me in my place, basically, <laughs> where I needed to go. No, I mean, it, it was, it, it definitely put me in the right direction for, for my passion. Well, that's um, good to hear. Yeah. Um, so, so what do you yeah, do? And it? I've, oh, so my main thing, I, I, I do toys. I like to make action figures. Um, I've been buying, pestering my parents for toys since I was two years old. <laughs> Um, as we all have, it's, it's never stopped. Um, as ashamed as I was in high school, it's kind of grown into who I am as a person now. Um, I fully embrace my nerd. Um, but yeah, so I'm a toy collector, um, big time nerd stuff, mm -hmm. Marvel, Star Wars, Transformers. So it was I, only I don't natural. think that uh, Marvel or Star Wars really count as big time nerd <laughs> stuff anymore, man. Well, well when, when you've got three Detolf cabinets filled with them, <laughs> um, I think it does. <laughs> okay, and I'm okay with that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for Ikea to open back up to get a fourth. Oh, geez. Um, so, yeah. So, collecting. Um, and as a as, when I was in high school, I did a lot of just like hand kit bashing kind of stuff making up my own characters, painting. Um, Before we go on, could you explain kit, uh, kit bashing? Oh, yes, kit bashing. So that's basically just taking a bunch of old toys, whatever you've got, and taking parts from one to another and making something new. Um, so it was a lot of, especially with Transformers, I would take one toy and, oh, this gun, this arm works cool on this one, this head works on that one, and now I've got a brand new character. Okay, cool. Um, slap on some paint. Um, and then, so that was kind of your start my, or my start is a little more basic. And then in, I started doing some scratch building, which was using, um, uh, styrene plastic and kind of going that step further to make custom parts to go onto mm -hmm. the toys. Um, and then opening up the floodgates with 3d printing in college, yeah. it was kind of like, I can do anything now and I don't have to cut myself with an exacto knife every five minutes um so yeah that was that was really really awesome to kind of get into mm -hmm. um and then it it wasn't so much of creativity as in ideas in my mind that were coming out it was more like i see that cool robot on tv i, w I want a toy of it i want to play with it mm -hmm. so that's kind of where my when i was in art school I definitely wasn't the strongest at a uh, concept. So it was more on the, I always considered myself more on the engineering side, the technical side. Um, I was yeah. good at making, but not so much good at the art side of it. Yeah. I usually yeah. refer to that in class as art with a capital A. And and I still use that term. <laughs> to you. <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. It's good to know it's stayed around. <laughs> yeah. Um, that stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what do you do for work now? So I am actually a lead uh, machine operator at 3D Systems, um, their healthcare branch. So 3D Systems is a huge global company. They were some of the pioneers in 3D printing. Um, so our branch here in, in Littleton, Colorado, uh, right outside Denver, um, we make uh, titanium surgical implants. Um, oh, that's cool. And like three... replacement oh. knees and stuff or what? Yeah, so it's, it's not as fun in the sense of crazy things. So we have the majority of our parts, we do a lot of production stuff. So it's um, a lot of spine 
um, fixes. Oh, cool. And um, so we have a, an array of products that we just work for certain customers, and they're basically all the same part, but mm -hmm. different designers essentially making different parts. Yeah, um, brackets and things like that. Exactly. Uh, I always we joke also of do... how much 3D printing is just making brackets for other things. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so we do um, we do a lot of customs, and those are those one-offs. Um, and nine times out of ten, it's a hip replacement. And so, um, just to be clear on, on the types of printers, uh, we'll get into to the technology of it in a little bit, but those are laser-centered, correct? Correct, yeah. So okay. they use um, titanium powder. Yeah. All right, well, uh, um, yeah, that's that's awesome. I'm so glad to... And each of those machines that you're running are probably, what, 3 to 10 million? Uh, somewhere around there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and we have about 30 of those. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, so... My team, um, I'm basically the lead of the morning shift. We've got three different shifts, um, mm -hmm. a, a morning, a night, and then a weekend. But um, there's about 12 of us that what we call flipping a machine. So it's just prepping it, yeah. um, pulling a build out, prepping it, cleaning up the powder, and getting it ready for the next build. That's insane. Um, so it's a big, it, yeah, it's a big, big organization. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, but it sounds like you're doing good and important stuff, which is always nice. Yes. Um, so I think that that's, that's a, let, let's just go ahead and start with the technical aspects of 3D printing. Uh, there's a few different kinds and um, let's just kind of go through them just as a primer for people who might not know. Um, I think it's okay to go ahead and start with the fancy kind that you're talking about. Uh, do you want to explain how the laser centered process works? Yeah, so um, I guess for people who kind of know a little bit of 3D printing, it's fairly simple where it's no, just a matter nobody of... nobody knows. <laughs> Pretend nobody okay. knows. So it's it's a laser that comes from the top. Of, it's got a lens to focus it. And um, so what we use is a, a full um, titanium build plate. And they're, I mean, the ones that we get brand new, they're about an inch and a half, two inches thick. Um, and... We have powder on each side, it's titanium powder that gets raked across that build platform um, at whatever layer height that they decide. Mm -hmm. And the laser comes down and it is essentially welding that powder to make a solid. Um, so it does its full shape. The build platform lowers a bit, brings over more powder and repeats that process over and over again. So you could do so this. The, you could do the same thing with uh, like sand and glue on the beach if you were really, really patient. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything yeah, else, so it, else particular to that pro process? Uh, not too much. I mean, in the end, you end up with a big block of powder, mm -hmm. um, and essentially, you just pull all the powder off, and we just use compressed air and and blow it all off and reuse that powder. Mm -hmm. um, and then our parts are, since they're essentially welded to that titanium platform, the next step in the post-processing is to uh, actually use an air hammer and air hammer those parts off the plate. Jeez. Yeah. And then do they get so, um, baked afterwards or no? Yeah. So it all depends on the process and what the customer wants. Oh, okay. um, the majority of what we do is, um, yeah, so they get, uh, the parts are printed they get taken off the plate. They get support removed. So I'll just say now the difference with this kind of uh, printing as opposed to like a nylon or a sandstone, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure we'll touch on later, is uh, we still do need support material. Oh, just really? Like you would. Yeah, and it's simply because of thermodynamics. <laughs> that. Um, oh, because it'll stress, so, right? Exactly. Yeah. So if supports aren't built properly, your parts the heat is concentrated in certain areas and, warp. and it'll warp. Um, I didn't even think about that. No, you're right. Yeah. It blew my mind when I first started working there. Um, <laughs> cause that, to me, that was the reason why you went with this kind of printing was you don't need supports. Yep. It should support itself, but no, you need it. Um, so they get support removed and then a lot of our parts, then they get sent out and they get heat treated. Um, and then they'll come back and if they have further finishing, um, we started to do a lot of uh, finishing with with essentially like a, a super high end Dremel, yeah, uh, rotary tool sanding. Um, but it's all customer says we need this, this, and this. This is how we want our final product to look like, and we do what we can to facilitate that. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool, and that's a really neat process. And I think we should just continue down the um, 
selectively centered powder printers. Um, yeah. Uh, the other two being um, the um, nylon one that you were talking about, and that's essentially the same process, but just with nylon powder instead of titanium, correct? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it's it's still using um, a laser, uh, which is welding that, that powder together, um, that nylon powder, mm -hmm. just creating a, a nice plastic, flexible, nice material. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, the last one that, that you said is the sandstone style, and that is used by, I forget who, but um, it's a plaster-like material that, that you essentially spray a um, solvent into, and wherever the solvent hits, it glues itself together. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Really good are... for just color models. Um, yeah. You're not going to want to use that for anything with multiple parts no assemblies no. and it's insanely fragile yeah yeah even with the glue yeah uh <laughs> that was that and it's also very very expensive right now um the amount of machine that you need to make that work is significantly greater than some of the cheaper machines that you see isn't it the glues like stupid expensive also it, yeah the materials were expensive but the actual materials weren't it was the fact that they were only provided by that one company that made ah, them expensive yeah. <laughs> um, that'll do it like most things in the world the raw yes. materials actually aren't too bad um yeah. yeah and so it just never really kind of got the edge um now the, so those are ba basically the powder style and those are some of the very high end very high detail um one of the other kinds of very high detail that is a wet pro process is the uh, epoxy-based printers. Uh, would you go through those for me? Yeah, so the... Um, and it, it Basically, people just refer them as to a, a resin printer um, yeah. or SLA, I believe. I can't remember what that stands for. But... Um, I don't remember what it stands for either. I'll look it up. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yes, so those are actually becoming a lot more affordable at the moment um the way it works is you've got a bed your build platform is essentially upside down and underneath you have a little tray or reservoir of resin so um the way it, this was basically the start of 3d printing this is one of the first types that they were uh, uh creating um and so the the platform lowers into the bed and one of the one of the styles is where you have a laser that does it, the outline, does the infill, uh, making your shape of that layer, and mm -hmm. then the the build plate would slide up, and then more um, resin essentially would just fill that little gap between the glass guess, the bottom, lens, yeah, yeah. Um, and do its next layer and continue that process. Mm -hmm. um, but what's really cool now that's making everything cheaper and faster is instead of a laser, they're using LCD screens. Yeah. Um, so these LCD screens, which are replaceable, they only have so many hours of usage, um, but they will flash the entire layer all at once, mm -hmm. um, your shape, and that cures the resin in that shape. So um, it's a really cool thing when you think, as, as you're used to 3D printing, it all depends on the complexity of the part, how big it is, which determines um, how fast your print prints, but with LCD, it's strictly your layer height or your height of your piece, because it's going to do every layer the same amount of time. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's one little column or the bed is full of columns. Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah. and, th and those are getting a lot cheaper now. That's that's my next venture. Yeah, those are down in like the three hundred dollar range now. So I'm less just less than that. kind of waiting to do it. I did see the other day that there's now um, water soluble resins for them. Yep. Uh, yeah, and that was kind of my last my last holdout for those was I did not want to deal with cleaning them. One thing we should mention is that the resins for those. Um, until they're cured or essentially uncured epoxy re uh, resin, yeah. that doesn't cure. And so it's incredibly gross and very hard to clean yes. and stinky. Um, what a lot of people are buying now, and that this is the, the first thing I'm going to do whenever I get a printer, is um, you can buy a, a fairly cheap ultrasonic cleaner. 
And yeah, like so most people would have them for cleaning jewelry and stuff like that. Yep, yep. exactly. Which they're about the perfect size when yep. you're printing small. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so people are putting a mixture of, I think, like mean green or some kind of cleaning solvent with a little bit of alcohol. And that thing just pulls all yep. the remaining goo out of there. Yeah, it's a really, um, it's an interesting process and I'm excited to see it. Um, it the price has dropped, but now the technical barriers and the functional barriers are starting to drop away as well. Uh, and the the resin is still a touch expensive. It's not too bad, but it's more yeah. expensive than what we're used to day to day. Exactly. But I think, and and this is how I would use it, and it's it it's almost like we're using 3D printing now as a final product. So yeah. I would use my FDM printer, which we'll touch on. Yeah. Um, for my prototypes, and then once that all comes out, I can throw it on the resin, so I'm not wasting all that. But yeah, uh, and one thing that I've seen that's very clever is people who are using those more expensive epoxy printers are printing one piece and then making a mold and then taking a bunch of casts. Yes, uh, yeah, save a lot of money because your final product is good enough to be worth casting. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to see that get better. As long um, as you design for that. Yes, as <laughs> that. long as you design for it, then you're good. Um, yeah. And by the way, SLA is just uh, a bad abbreviation of stereolithography. Oh. stupid. That's what it was. I had yeah. a feeling it was something like that. Yeah, I hate, cool. I hate these abbreviations <laughs> that don't actually match. There's no A in stereolithography. I guess in graphy. That's stupid. It should be S-L-Y yep. or something. Uh, anyway. Um, resin printers. <laughs> yeah, they're resin printers. We can all call them resin printers. They have a very weird look to them. They have a red or orange like house around them, which is an ultraviolet protector. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you leave the resin out in the sun, it will harden immediately. If, Don't do that. Yeah, it's, I think you need everything to be the perfect temperature. Like yes, you're, it's very uh, particular. Um, yeah which is not the best for those of us that are rough on our hardware. <laughs> and and ones who live in Colorado where it gets cold in the winter. <laughs> oh, well, I have the issue in Alabama of humidity. <laughs> humidity is such a huge issue here. Is is that going to be bad for, would that be bad for resin though? I have as no idea. You, yeah, no I guess I, I'll, find, I'll I just, figure it out eventually. Yeah. yeah. I just know a lot of, one of my coworkers, he just recently got a uh, an Elegoo Mars. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I was looking printer. at. Yep, and uh, and he couldn't print for the first few months because of how cold it was. Just because you need a decent amount of ventilation or at least the printer in a different room. Yeah. So his basement was his only option where it was way too cold. Yep. Yeah. Um, we'll get back to environmental stuff when we get to, to yeah. filament printers because, yeah, that's a big issue. Yes. Uh, and then, yeah, let's go on to filament printers. So the, these are the 3D printers that people have probably... Oh, one last thing with, with stereolithographic um, printers, with, with resin printers. Speaking of toys, in the beginning of the movie Toy Soldiers, they are yes. actually using <laughs> a SLA printer in that. And yes. It's from like 96 no. or something like that, or 94. It's crazy but old. But in the completely wrong way. Yes, it's backwards. <laughs> um which is hilarious to me, but whatever. <laughs> it's very silly. Um, yes. <laughs> but it, but it, it, that is exactly what it is. Um, yep. So the printers that most people are used to seeing are uh, what are referred to as filament printers. Uh, the abbreviation, one of the abbreviations being FDM, which is actually a trademark of 3D systems, I think, or one of, or one of them. It's a trademark of somebody. Yeah, I, I had no um, idea. But so the the open source one, the one you're supposed to use that's not trademarked, is FFF Fused Filament Fabrication. Ah, uh, yeah, it's not as catchy, <laughs> but uh, nope, gets it done. Uh, but yeah, FDM is trademark, which I it drives me nuts when people u use it on online for printers that are you know just some knockoff printer. Yep, yep, that's funny. Yeah, it's very silly because it is definitely a trademark term. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so, so walk, walk us through how those printers work. Yeah, so yeah, just like you said, those are the ones you're going to see um, in in stores now. You can go to Home Depot, Best Buy. Um, they're kind of everywhere now. Office where, Depot. Yeah, Office Depot, Micro Center. <laughs> um, so they are a... Um, they look, I mean, it obviously depends on what style, but 
it's basically you have a frame and it's got a build platform, so just a little plate, and um, and you have some kind of extruder, um, which essentially is a motor that's grabbing a thin wire of plastic filament, um, which looks a whole lot like a like weed whacker, yeah, um, whatever it's called, um, string. Yeah. Um, so that essentially is getting pulled into the extruder and heated into a hot end nozzle um, and then pumped out. So the way I would like to describe it is think of a computer controlled hot glue gun. Yeah. Um, so you're essentially just melting this plastic into your layers um, and it will solidify as it's being um, as it's on that platform. The bill plate will lower and it'll just keep doing that layer after layer. Um, yeah. it's definitely one of the easier things to work with when it comes to 3d printing so it's just more readily available um, and cheaper a lot cheaper yeah. there's no need for a laser or a fancy bath that can handle the epoxy or anything like that it's just yeah. as long as it can get hot you're good to go yeah P yeah people are finding ways to make them out of old cd drives so <laughs> yeah they're, well, they're, now they're pretty it's so funny that it's just cheaper to buy one than it is to make one out of anything. And that, that bar crossed in maybe what, 2014 ish. Once MakerBot lost its trademark. Yeah. Then it just went <laughs> ramp went, went rampant. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, so those are the machines that you use at home. And those are also the machines that I use at home. Um, what brand do you use? I have two, but one is sitting in a corner cause it, is not a good brand anymore um but my my workhorse is the creality ender 3 pro okay cool and what's the one that's sitting in the corner abandoned a, a tier time up mini 2 i don't even know what that is yeah it's i don't know have you heard of the company called affinia uh -uh. so affinia is their like american side the tier time was um the chinese side it's when I worked in, I, so I worked in Miami at a, a intern there at a 3D printing shop, and mm -hmm. that's what they that was their primary machines were the oh. uh, the tier time uh, up plus two, and mm -hmm. it was an incredible machine. They had good customer service. Um, it was just kind of one that I was exposed to every day, so I went toward that um, that brand. And when I had the cash, I spent about six hundred bucks on it, and it did great for like a year, year and a half, and then. It, software started to get worse and it's all proprietary software oh no no um yeah, yeah we'll talk so, about that in a minute yes um <laughs> and so their their customer support and obviously once my one-year warranty hit it the, all the parts started messing up yeah um luckily they worked with me a little bit shortly after but i still have issues i've been every so often i'll spend a few hours trying to get it back up and running properly and it's just a nightmare yeah, and the, the the Ender Three was about two fifty, and it is, like I said, it's a workhorse. Yeah, it is. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I have the um, second gen Mono Price MP Select, which um, is, is now up fire? to. It's pretty much the same one we had back at Far way back when. Um, you didn't have one of those at Far. What? Yeah, we did. We didn't have one. Not at the moment. Didn't we? We had two oh. of them. Did we get those after you were gone? Yeah. You okay. know, uh, the yeah. when I left, all you had was the 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 replicator two. The oh, okay. Bot. Yeah. So we eventually bought two of the um, bought two of the MP selects, and I bought the second gen one when I moved up to Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, but the one that I bought when we moved up here just cleared. Um, I think it's a, it's just about to clear nineteen kilometers of filament. Ooh. Yeah. See now I'm curious. Now I want to see how much mine has. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nineteen kilometers of filament through that thing. Jeez. Yeah. It's. I think it's like fifty something rolls of filament. Yeah. There's no way I've gone through fifty. Yeah. Five zero rolls of filament. That thing has seen some life. Um, I and then I fall of last year, I bought a. Um, oh God! What is it? I can never remember the name of the thing. It is a. Now I'm gonna go completely name blank. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell are you? Something you probably look at every day. 
It's an Anycubic Mega S. That's what it is. Oh, yes. Okay. So that's, is... It was about 250 Um Pretty much the biggest thing that it had was it had um, a re- easily replaceable extruder, and yeah. it came with a second extruder in the box, which was awesome. That's like um, a good and bad thing. Yeah. It, it, it indicates <laughs> that they have concerns about their extruder, <laughs> yes. but it, the, the fact that there's just a spare one is real nice. Um, but so far I haven't really had any problems with it. Um, some of its fancier features I kind of gave up on cause they're more trouble than they're worth. Um, one thing we should mention is that these, these filament printers are kind of what everybody has at the house uh, or at least all the printing people have at the house. These are the work, these are the workhorse printers. Um, mm-hmm. and they are not, they are not reliable in the same way that like your refrigerator is reliable. <laughs> Uh, they need no. constant messing with. Yes. Um, so definitely when probably you or I go out and look at buying a printer, a significant portion of why we buy one printer over another is, is can I take it apart without, you know, going insane? Yes. Um, and in all honesty, for me, um, I was, I, I was between a, um, a mono price, the Ender and was another machine i can't remember um but it all came down to i I mean for me it was the frame yeah as opposed to i know for yours i've seen a lot of people they make those upgrades where they have the 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 braces on yeah mine has the triangular braces on the front for the for the mp yeah not not only did i just not like that design i didn't like the look of it having to do that (laughs) but i didn't want to have to do that especially with with steel Mine's that was also like screwed panel. down to a piece of plywood, so it doesn't move. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't have that issue. And, that, that, and but what I was saying before was just the uh, the the community, the online community for the Ender Three is huge. Oh yes, yeah, that's one thing. That's one regret I kind of had about it is um, I didn't like the single side drive. I like dual Z screws. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And uh, by the way, we're talking about something that most people probably don't care about <laughs> yes. or know about. Um, <laughs> But there's there's some printers to make them less expensive will have a driven end and a floating end of some of the axes of some of the directions that the printer can move in. And some people are cool with that and some people aren't. And it just kind of depends on how much faith you have in the the engineers. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically um, all it comes down to, but um So we have the printers let's say we have the, the we have these home printers um and i want to make something how do i make something what, what's what's my step-by-step process for going from let's just say i already have the file i've got a file on thingiverse or somewhere else and i want to print it what's the standard for your ender for for the printers that i have so not your weird you, printer yeah <laughs> um <laughs> You need a slicing software. So the slicing software is basically telling the machine what to do, how to cut up your model, um, tons and tons of different variables that you can manipulate to get the print looking like how you want it to look. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, there are... the closest thing for slicing software that I think I've, I've used as an example is um, it's like the print dialog box in like Word. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's exactly. That's essentially what it is, but it's its own little program, just on steroids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or some um, sort of psychotic drug. Yeah, both. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's tons of of ones that you can pay for. Uh, one of the most common ones, though, is free, called Cura, C U R A. Um, and for your beginner, it's perfect. Um, yeah, that's what I use. Just about. Yeah, and so do I, just because I don't want to pay and. In all honesty, I'm comfortable. I like it. It does what I need it to do, and I have no reason to switch. And all the settings um, are where you know where they are. Yeah. And <laughs> so there's another one that's really popular called Simplify 3D. Yeah. Um, I believe you have to pay for that. Um, but a lot of people use it, and I guess it just has more... It's going to be more for f- stupid fine details and custom supports that half of the time people don't need. Um but yeah, so you would take any kind of 3D model, 
throw it in there. And Kira, I recommend nine times out of ten because it's got really good uh, base settings. Oh um, dear! Just... Simplified 3D is 150 bills. That's what I was thinking. Oh, I thanks. would not be surprised if they have like a a quote unquote hobbyist license that you can get. Yeah, probably. It's still, jeez. Yeah. Um, but it's apparently it's it's miles better in oh, some. It's a 10 percent educational discount. Ouch. That's not that's even, just yeah, that's, cruel. Yeah, that's nothing. Yeah, people are just gonna go to Kira. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. that's probably what they're teaching in school. For all that's of our listeners, Kira does just fine. Yeah. Um, and like I said, if if you don't have any experience with 3D printing, get Kira and use their basic support, their their standard settings that they come with, mm-hmm. and chances are you will do just fine if you're if you're not designing yourself yet. And one thing that's really nice about that that I like for teaching with Kira is that the hover text like the tool tips are actually really good uh so if you just like oh, poking yes. around in there you can actually kind of figure out what all the words mean yeah and something that i still use like i've been using cura for over a year and a half and i still just type in on google cura support settings and if you're on their website it will literally break down every single thing with yep. pictures and yeah, it is it'll- give you examples <laughs> of what what this setting looks like and that setting looks like and all that yeah yeah and um, one nice thing i've noticed as well is that they do have some very advanced tools that you can turn on and off so you can yeah. leave them off until you know what you're looking for and then you can go hunt them down in the menus and activate them yeah and they do a good job with with auto um correcting things so yes if you edit something they're going to tell you that doesn't work out w- and according to these other settings. Yeah, I've definitely abused uh, the make printable feature. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> just start designing to make printable. Come on. <laughs> no, well, yeah, but sometimes it's just easier to poke the button. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> and and uh, so then once... So we, we've put it in... Cura, we, we've, we have our pretty little file. I made my little gnome or whatever, and it's in Cura. And I hit slice, and then what happens? And then, obviously, depending on your printer, um, if you've got some kind of Wi-Fi setup, I'm sure you can. It'll you can send the file to your printer. What uh, do you most use? cases. So I just have. Uh, I just use the micro SD. Okay. Um, I I bought one of those micro SD to SD adapters. Mm-hmm. Um, and printed a little housing for that, and um, so I just use that. And I just walk the files up because chances are I have to turn my machine on anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just send the files manually. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of printers. Some of my other machine that did Wi-Fi printing. So that was nice, but it took a lot longer because you had to yes. slice it, then send it. And then if there was an issue, you had to send it again. And then it, it was not fun. Um, yeah, and then I also believe in the SD card method. Yeah, and and just having something local stored local is a lot better. Um, there are some printers I know, and I I want to say some of those resin printers are like that, where you need it um, hooked up the whole time that you're printing. Oh, really? To, it has to be hooked up to your computer. Mm, I don't like that. So that's yeah, that's something I am not a fan of. So I'm gonna <laughs> that it's just a matter of doing my research and figuring out exactly but um there are some of the older fdm printers that are the same way where you need to have your yep. computer hooked up and then whoops my battery died so does your print yeah or my computer does a windows update and that's the end of that <laughs> yes yeah, shuts off in the middle of a print uh-huh. um yeah that's that's always rough um one thing that that i also like for the sd card method and that's what i use for teaching and what i've always used for teaching is the SD card method because then if you mess up a file, you have to go through the uh, walk of shame back to the computer and reload the <laughs> file and all that. Yeah, there was a you can make sure you right the first time. Th- there were plenty of times where I wanted to just take the MakerBot and put it at my cubicle. Yes, <laughs> for that yeah. exact reason. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, even now uh, I have my printers downstairs from where my computer is and in a box. They actually have their own little cabinet now that's completely yeah. sealed because I hate listening to them. Oh, that's uh, yeah, makes sense. 
That is one really important thing. If you're interested in getting into 3D printing, that printer has got to go in a room that's acoustically isolated from the rest of your house. Yes. Because we, uh... unlike an air conditioner or something like that, you cannot tune them out because they constantly change pitch, and it's yes. terrible. Um, we had a when we first moved to Colorado, we had a one bedroom apartment. Ooh. So, and we moving from a two bedroom in Florida. So. We had to sacrifice, and I had the printer in the uh, in our dining room, which was our living room, basically. Mm -hmm. And that sucked. Yeah. That wasn't fun. <laughs> so we yeah. made sure the next year we have a, a we got a two bedroom, and this is my workspace. I've got a a nice tooled um, pegboard uh, bench that I just built. I have an enclosure for my printer now. I've got a desk, my cabinets. I, I have my my work room. It's definitely a um, a necessity. Yeah, I would say that's pretty much a requirement yeah. for a printer because anything over yeah. about 30 minutes is going to drive you up the wall. Yes. And and I was, when, before we moved, we were looking into townhomes and stuff, mm -hmm. but I needed at least to have where my printer is on the same floor that we hang out at. I did not want to have to do that walk of shame, but upstairs. Oh, really? Every, yeah, I, I, I couldn't. <laughs> as long as the room is on the same floor as where we're, because I'm constantly running back and forth. You print a lot smaller. You print a lot of smaller stuff, though, right? Yeah, but it's because I pr I print at a layer height of point one two usually. That's pretty big. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I was printing at point zero eight, um, yeah, small. but and it, the prints came out beautiful. But for the most part, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. Um, if I print like toy heads, I'll do at point eight. Mm -hmm. But for the for any bodies or most most parts, point one two. But yeah, I'll print literally like maybe three inches cubed, and it's like five six hours. Yeah. So, yeah, most of my prints are still pretty long. I mean, just due to my work schedule, um, I try to set up prints going overnight. You know, five six hours overnight, and then up to ten hours while I'm at work. Yeah. I just let them run. That's what I do too. I have definitely have them scheduled. Yes. Um, I've been late to work a few times waiting for that first layer to go down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's one thing that's really important. These printers, um, everybody kind of treats them as though they're magic, but really yeah. like the the equivalent that I give is always like they're like having like an old Corvette from the 50s where like <laughs> once it's starting and running, yeah, it's going to run like a bat out of hell, but getting it started on a cold morning, miserable. <laughs> yes. Um, and so, yeah, you and I both watched the first lay layer go down on our prints, uh, I think. And For the most part, I, I've... Yeah, sometimes I I've, get lazy about it, but... Well, I've lucky, I've lucky, luckily, I have been blessed, I would say, with this printer where it just kind of works the way I want it to. Mm -hmm. um, the Ender 3 Pro comes with a, I don't know if you know of BuildTac... Yeah, that brand. It's I mean, it's basically a, a printing surface that has a little texture on it. Mm -hmm. um, so mine came with a magnetic Biltac plate, um, yeah. and it holds a first layer great. So as long as my bed is level, um, and I always squish my first layers a little bit more than they probably should, mm -hmm. but too. that's because I never print directly on the bed. Like my actual parts, I oh, make sure I that do. they're. So I and I just switched printing to ABS plastic, and of course we can talk about this. Yeah, we will. Um, but printing ABS, my bottom layers when they are sitting on supports are beautiful, and so I raise everything about two millimeters. So instead of printing on a raft, um, I just print on supports, and my parts come off perfectly. So I don't worry about my first layers being squished. That's an interesting Because it's idea. just support yeah. material. Yeah, and I can I still with... print flat on the bed and just plan to trim the uh, mold line, I guess. Oh, I, I hate... Well, for me, because I print small toy stuff... Yeah, that's true. I, I, that, that would lose, you know, a, a half a millimeter, which is important. And it would create a lip, which I would have to shave off if I need that to plug in to something. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because you're, um, you're and... fitting into existing parts. Or parts to parts, but I still have tight tolerances. Yes. Um, but also, the Ender 3 is, is notorious for coming with um, warped build platforms. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's usually just like a small dip in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm printing in the middle with a small 
small prints never an issue, but big prints, um, it can cause a problem. Yeah. Now I actually just just re-leveled one of mine that decided to start to warp. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I mean that's just part of what happens. We're not friends right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's actually f funny. Uh, speaking of these things being unreliable, mine have been running at probably ninety percent capacity for the last three weeks since all this COVID stuff started, or maybe last oh, yeah. month. Uh, I've been printing all the masks and everything. Oh, and, nice. Uh, so, yeah, they've been running out of a 24-hour day. They, they're probably, the head is moving 22 of those hours. Jeez. Um, yeah, they've both been just <laughs> running. Um, but I think we just cleared 130 or 140 masks or something like that. So I'm pretty happy wow. with them. They're That's awesome. Behaving. Although last night, both of them decided to misbehave at the exact same time. So. <laughs> Um, they're revolting they are Going revolting <laughs> they've decided that human beings aren't, aren't worth sa saving apparently yeah. <laughs> uh, this is how Terminator happens it's not yeah, it's that not... they shoot us it's that they refuse to save us <laughs> just one, two printers at a time <laughs> yeah. yeah pretty much um, yeah so let's talk about the plastic um, the plastic that I generally print with and I think that you probably were printing with before is PLA uh, yeah. which is polylactic acid. Um, generally, it's used just because it's easy to print, and uh, it's biodegradable, so I feel a little less terrible about just <laughs> throwing it in the trash or, you know, printing yes. a million little tchotchkes. Um, and it, it prints well onto painter's tape, which is just my favorite thing in the world, that this green painter's tape <laughs> is just the perfect bed material. It makes me so yep. happy. Um so why 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 are you switching back to ABS? So I used um, ABS at first on my old machine, mm -hmm. and it worked great because that printer was enclosed. Um, and then all of a sudden, with all the settings and things changed, everything looked like crap. Mm -hmm. So when I got the, I switched to PLA. It worked like candy, just printed like butter. Everything was perfect. Um, but and then I just kept that going when I got the Ender because I had a good brand and with when you print with ABS you need that enclosure um, and there were a lot of other concerns too um, that I realized haven't mattered at least for my printer with it when it comes to keeping one of these things enclosed with heat and all that but mm -hmm. um, for toy making PLA does not hold up after a week when it comes to joints and. Oh. Um, it because it's it's a softer material um it's a lot stronger so you can flex it it won't break it's great for your standard around the house things um but for any type of so if you know toys at all they use a lot of ball joints yeah um just hinges they become super super loose um and for me something i strive for my main focus is articulation i like things that can move and hold a pose uh pla cannot so yeah, PLA is um, also very um it doesn't stretch no or it doesn't like to flex yeah well so i've actually had better luck with printing like ball joint like snap fit joints we'll say mm -hmm. uh with pla and i think i might just be one of the few because a lot of people i talk to have that issue mm -hmm. um where i can print those and they don't snap but i think that just i mean it's either my tolerances or just the way i design them mm -hmm. um but again, I've got a box here filled with my old prints, and I want to print them all again in ABS. <laughs> yeah, um, they just don't hold up over time. And I'm personally, when it comes to printing, I like gray, and I like it flat and light, like colored. I like I don't like the reflective shininess that uh, PLA is. Yeah. Yeah, that, um, that shininess. I actually immediately uh, flat black or flat gray all of my stuff. It yeah, and I know a lot of coat of spray paint. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people do that. For me, I, I hate painting. Just I don't like the paint and paint rub. And personally, to me, I I, I treat three D prints as prototypes. I like the gray look, um, mm -hmm. and it keeps a lot of detail. Um, that is true. Yeah, but yeah, so that's that's my main reason to switch to the uh, to ABS again. Um, and so far, yeah, that makes sense. I've had to. The tolerances are definitely different. So ABS plastic, and we'll just kind of go into this with that PLA too. Um, ABS plastic has a higher melt temperature. Mm -hmm. So um, as you print, 
with ABS plastic, you need a heated bed. And then, so you print your head where your material is coming out is hot, your bed is hot, and as it prints higher and higher, the center layers start to cool. But the parts that were most recently printed because they're closer to the head are hot. The parts that are closer to the bed, just because the bed is hot, those are stay hot. They stay hot. So things start to shrink unevenly um, and cause breakage. So just due to the shrink factor, uh, tolerances definitely need to change uh -huh. um, when it comes to snap fit parts and any of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and the shrinkage rate of a of ABS and PLA is different as well, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and I know, I mean, from what most people say is a, the PLA, at least with this style of printing, you're not going to notice a little any bit of shrinkage. Um, oh, I can. If you get like an 8-inch print oh. on there, it'll do it. Okay, then, yeah, I guess yeah. I haven't printed big enough for it to affect. <laughs> oh, I did a sculpture that was um, the winged victory, like the headless, armless uh lady oh, yes. with the big wings out the back i mm -hmm. printed one of those it was about five feet tall in parts and yeah I, and i could tell jeez yeah you could definitely get find the gaps i had to, to i had to finish it like a car body oh uh, yeah that, that was sucks. fun it was a good summer project yeah. um it's now in the the drawing professor's um office <laughs> oh that's cool <laughs> yeah um uh, what were you gonna say um but yeah so peel or abs will shrink yeah. um so it's just it's just one of those things material properties you have to kind of keep in mind when picking out which ones you want um but yeah so when you do print abs you definitely need some kind of enclosure um and yeah, that people keep the whole thing hot so the whole thing can sh can shrink at the same time at the yeah, end as opposed to exactly. constantly during the print yeah exactly yeah. and and people have gone as cheap as throwing a cardboard box on their machine yeah, and sometimes um, that that extra few degrees helps yeah and, but i'm not putting a cardboard box on my printer that gets hot yeah, <laughs> um, that's also a fire hazard y yes um yeah. and and it's happened before people say that their printers have caught fire luckily mine has not yeah generally um, if a 3d printer catches fire it's because the power supplies are garbage power supplies that are made in china and one of the capacitors will blow and catch on fire exactly yeah, um, um, that's what happened to one of mine. But luckily, was it was it, was it your mono price? Yep, and I just replaced yeah. it with a heavy duty power supply, and now it works like a champ. And and uh, and that's what those are are known for. That was part of the reason I didn't get it. Well, and that's also why you watch the first layer go down because that's when the printer's drawing the most power, is heating up both the bed and the head at the same uh. time. Uh, and I and I was. It, Luckily, I actually didn't have the lights on in the room. I had flipped the lights off, and I was just waiting for it to like put the barrier down, like like the edge ring down. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I just saw like literally like tongues of fire in, inside <laughs> oh, the control board, and I was like, "Yep, that's gonna go <laughs> off now." Uh, oh no! And, but yeah, I just took took the case off and and uh, replaced the power supply, and it fixed it. Um, <laughs> so it's fine now. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I definitely Ooh. bought a nicer power supply. And if I bought another yeah. one, I would definitely put a new power supply on it immediately. Yeah. Um, and I know that's one that was like I said, that was one of the determining factors with the Ender. Yeah. Um I've heard of little fires starting just from wires themselves. But yeah. again, I haven't had any issues. I've got my printer in an enclosure that I built. Um and that is one thing to note if you ever do want to print ABS and you put your machine in an enclosure you want to at the very least take out the power supply because yeah. as that thing heats up you don't want your power supply to heat up yeah the other option is to just put a giant computer fan on top of your power supply to just keep air move moving but then you run the risk of air because you usually want some kind of ventilation that oh, might yeah, cool yeah, off your yeah, part yeah but um you can get away with yeah, a lot of different there's I've, I've, you, you can look online and find all sorts of, me of yes. methods to get this stuff done yeah. um well, let's go. Let's. I think that that pretty much covers technical stuff before we start to get into really esoteric things. <laughs> um, so you design mainly toys, lots of transformer stuff, lots of robots, not very much organic stuff, and neither do I. Um, so, Correct. what piece of software do you use to do that? So, I use Rhino 3D for the Mac um, for OS. Oh, really? Use it on Mac? Yeah, still because it was cheap. Oh, I guess um, it was, wasn't it? 
so do you when use grasshopper I, now or no no don't even talk to me about grasshopper um <laughs> No, I don't. I don't even want to touch that thing. Um, yeah, you showed me Rhino, and I had a, a Mac at the time, and it mm-hmm. was on beta for the Mac. So it was beta for like three years. So I was just coasting on a free software, and mm-hmm. then when they finally were ready to release it, the those who were on beta got to buy it for a discount. So it was about three hundred dollars. Uh, oh, for as a full professional light, uh, light exactly. Uh, it's nice as a, as a, as opposed to five hundred at the time. Yeah. Um, I know now the newest they just came out with Rhino six and it's like a thousand. Yeah, I think so. Um, so I'm gonna stick with Rhino five for a while. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I use it on my Mac. Um, I have a sixteen or a a, a fifteen inch MacBook Pro from 2014 mm-hmm. with sixteen gigs of RAM and. I with my personal models, I do just fine. Yeah, um, that's a funny thing. Like I have a desktop that I use for Rhino. Um, yeah, and it's I think I built it in twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen. I'd have to look, um, but it's literally such a low power processor that there's actually no fan on the CPU. There's just a heatsink. <laughs> uh, it's a passive cooled. Um, it's a passive cooled C, uh, C, C, CPU. And you're right, like, as long as you're careful in Rhino, it'll run it. It's not as, yeah, the, it's not like Photoshop or Illustrator, really no. grumpy. I can't even, I, I still have the Creative, or not even Creative Cloud, the CS5 or something like that, that I can't really run. Yeah. Um, um, the only time I ever have issues, and I have a specific customer who likes to, um, he likes me to edit Thingiverse files, which is weird. the bane of my existence. Yeah. Um, Rhino uses what's called NURBS, N-U-R-B-S, um, and it's referred to as just solid modeling, um, uh, mm-hmm. as opposed to mesh modeling. Um, yeah. And anytime explain, I throw... explain mesh modeling. So mesh modeling is basically, I mean, it's more used for sculpting. Um, so any surface is broken down into a bunch of triangle surfaces. Mm-hmm. Um, so usually a high detail model, you're going to have millions of, um, of surfaces. Yeah. And for those people that are into video games, this is also referred to as polygon count. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Polygons. Um, and video games get away with it because they can do less polygons because they have texture. Yes. Um, you have, they have, you have color and things like that. Yeah. So anytime I download a, and so the, the, the file types are STLs. Um, and those that for your printers and, um, and those are meshes. So anytime I throw a mesh file into Rhino, um, it likes to poop. Yes. Um, yes, and it's it does. just, a, but, but what's really nice and I think is a very rare thing from people I've talked to with other softwares is you can convert, um, meshes into NURBS. Um, it doesn't always help with processing power. Um, yeah, it gets grumpy. But you can still reduce and and like when I've worked with with friends who who use um, uh, meshes as models and I try to print, I just lower that polygon count. Oh yeah. Um, because when you're three D printing, a mesh with two million models is going to look just the same with five hundred or, or five hundred thousand models in the end. Yeah, I, I usually take things on when I post things to Thingiverse. I usually try to get every model under like maybe twenty five thousand polygons. Yeah, and that's that's fair. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Well, it keeps the um, file sizes smaller. Yeah, and that's that's my problem with my Mac right now is running out of space. Yep. Um, but yeah, so uh, Rhino is, I mean, I, it's ideal for me. I, I, obviously, I haven't tried too many other programs out. Um, it works a lot like Adobe Illustrator, where it's all vector based. Uh, I actually. We'll compare it more to Corel Draw, if any yeah. of you guys have ever used that. Um, Corel Draw is very straightforward. I loved it more than Illustrator. Um, <laughs> I, I when I used to work at the uh, at a at a trophy shop, um, Awards for You in Tallahassee, and that's what we used for laser engravers. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
it's so you basically draw out your vectors, make your shapes, and then you extrude them, which is turning them into a solid. Um, yeah, it's kind of like pushing something through a through a cookie extruder. Exactly. Um, so it's 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 just a lot of drawing, um, and of course, I probably can't explain it in a simpler way, just because I've been exposed to that kind of art for the past ten years, basically. Yeah, and it has. Um, a, I think the only other thing to add that's a pretty much the right way to that's the way I usually explain it. You draw in two dimensions on every axis and then kind of extrude it together until you get the shape you want. There um, you go. The only other thing I would kind of add on top is that it's got a lot of like good mathematical stuff. Like you can yeah. fit a circle to three curves, which Oh yes. Yeah. yeah, which doing by hand is essentially impossible, but for the computer it's just gotta like keep running the algorithm until it figures it out. Yeah. Um so there's a lot of very neat math things that now I like I can't go back to Illustrator. <laughs> like I have to design stuff in Rhino. Export That's how it, I was export it as an SVG, <laughs> yeah. put it into Illustrator and then color it. <laughs> yeah, and any time that I would wanna design something for uh, laser engraving, laser cutting. Um, mm -hmm. I would do it at home on my Rhino, and then just bring it over into Corel because things just make sense. Yeah. Um, it has a it has a low barrier of entry, but a high ceiling for skill if you really want to get good at it. Yeah, I think the way that you even described it was uh, the way Rhino does is they do anything from jewelry to boats. Yeah, to naval architecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and it, that's that's a big thing. Architecture uses Rhino a lot um, for models. It's it's to me the same way that Adobe Illustrator is. You can make anything. Yeah. I feel like Rhino Rhino's that same way. Um, you're you're kind of free to model as you see it and, and it's i don't know i guess it's more of like you don't have as many restrictions when it comes to moving things around or drawing different shapes mm -hmm. um like some other softwares um yeah now, the used... one thing i will say is it absolutely does not do organics yes like, well well it doesn't <laughs> we'll do say. them well true yeah that's a good way to um, put it you have to like something that i have it's really stopped me from going into other softwares is because I've been using Rhino for so long, my mind almost thinks in Rhino. Mm -hmm. And I know that might sound crazy, but it's just as you walk around thinking of ideas to make, you're already planning it out in your head, how to yeah. do it in your software. Um, and you have to think of everything as a sharp line or a shape rather than an organic shape where you, Take yeah, an like octopus and try modeling. to, yeah. yeah. Take an octopus and try to draw the lines that make up all the curves. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it, it's almost impossible. Not uh, with a grasshopper. Don't talk to me about grasshopper. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So grasshopper is like their. I to me, it's their answer to it's parametric design, right? Yeah. In the end, it's where you can make a model and attach a. I, I'd say it's like a physical toggle for code. Yes, that's a good way to put it. it. It's a instead of drawing the object, you're coding the object, and for some people that works really well, and for some people it works really terribly. Yes, generally, for hobby, it works really bad. Yeah, generally what I've found is by the time I'm done with the grasshopper thing, I could have just made all the versions of that thing in Rhino that I needed to make. Um, like only every once in a while is Grasshopper the right choice, and generally it's when I want something that the result is obviously programmed. Yes. So I use it um, a lot for like trees and tentacly things and stuff like that, where I need lots of what looks yes. like organic randomness. You can. I know a lot of engineers use it. Uh, yes. Because you can just on the fly say, "I want from three floors of a building." to 15 and hold all the same properties yeah and i want it to scale structure and and stresses and things like that yeah yeah it for and for the stuff I that was, you and i do it's not useful or no, not, and not 100 percent useful i don't like to code that wasn't my strong suit at all so it just my mind doesn't work that way i guess i think more in the maker side of physically making something even if i have to remake it 14 times to get it right yeah i'll i'll do that because i know it works um yeah but it's similar to the, like the comparable which when i talk to people is um solidworks 
the software, mm -hmm. which is kind of the industry standard for any product design. Um, yeah, for but industrial design and stuff like that. Yeah, but for someone like me who's like, I've used it once before and I absolutely hated it. Um, just because Rhino is so different and less restrictive. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have a if you make a cube that has a cylinder on top, you have to create a different plane just to make any surface detail. Um, mm -hmm. It's really technical sounding, but it, it I just didn't have enough time in it to understand it. Um, it it's a completely different way of thinking. Yeah, it is interesting um, how you do get so into one method of construction or one yeah, method of design to me it's a weird thing to think that you can have two outcomes look exactly the same but made completely different oh yeah the inputs are entirely different but you get the same yeah. doodad on the outside yeah um why don't you go ahead and walk us through kind of your method of designing let's say you get new transformer toy the head is wrong you want to make a better head what what are your steps? Um, bust out my calipers, number one thing. Um, and it's funny, I actually still have the calipers you gave us in one of our classes. <laughs> it still works. <laughs> That's what <laughs> That's I use every know. single day. <laughs> um, but the so I'll actually go through one of the little projects I'm working on. Um, yeah, it's perfect. Is just a little add-on kit for a transformer. Um, mm -hmm. It was a toy that was made to kind of be an updated look to an old version um, that came out in like 2005. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just reusing a an existing uh, modern uh, transformer that, um, and they just made a new head and gave it a new paint scheme. Mm -hmm. um, but design wise, didn't look too much like the original. Um, and that so it just came. You. To an extent, uh, <laughs> it was more of its accessories. The 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 pick the the toy itself is miles better. It looks great. It's nice and chunky and squared and boxy, like I like. Um, but it was missing some of those key characteristics of the original character. Um, it, for example, some shoulder cannons and little missile pods for his his actual shoulders, um, mm -hmm. biceps. Uh, so I basically just took references from the original. Um, and I'm constantly, that's that's for me, like I mentioned earlier, I'm not the most creative, so I'm never going to come up with my own character, my own design. Mm -hmm. um, but where I get my creativity out is figuring out how to make the thing I see in 2D into 3D. So um, you're coming from like comic book references, not a, not an existing toy there. Exactly. Okay. Um, for the most part. So it's either comic books, TV shows, whatever. If there isn't a toy of it, or it's way too expensive... Um, and I want to make something with my own little tweaks to it. Um, that's where I'm taking references. I'm taking any kind of angles I can do. Um, I can get from existing shows or movies, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, making them 3D. Um, but yeah, so I take get my references, what I want it to roughly look like. And then I have to figure out how to make that work on the Transformer. Um, so usually if, let's say, the shoulder part the one that's actually going onto the bicep connecting to the toy. Um, I tried to make a, a rough mock-up of that part. Um, that way I kind of know what I'm fitting my piece on. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, so in this case, it's just a blocky shoulder. Um, so I take the measurements of that and it has one little peg hole, which I'm going to use for an attachment point. And it has one little peg in the front that serves almost no purpose, but it's something that's going to get in the way. Um, mm -hmm. So I know I can't just make a random size box and call it a day. Because um, especially with fitting something 3D printed onto something injection molded, it needs to f have the right tolerances and fit nice. And that way I'm not messing around with it and it just pops right off. Um, so yeah, take all the measurements I can. Um, and then I just create that, let's say the stock toy, that part in Rhino, I'll reverse engineer it and then make my new part to kind of go around it um, okay. in whatever fashion I need it to. And now do so you usually, um, do you usually in Rhino, do you draw each face almost entirely or do you kind of start with a, 
big block of material and cut and add and cut and add. It's definitely adding for the most part. Um, so I always will start with my, um, just my poly lines. So like, I'll take the front shape of it. It's a square. I'll make the square, the right measurements. Um, and then work from there. I'm never really subtracting unless it's for surface detail, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm just starting from nothing, building out rather than I'm doing it subtracting. as drawings. Okay, cool. Yeah. And um, then um, you print it, and it either does or doesn't fit, right? Yeah, nine times out of ten, it doesn't fit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a simple. I'm sitting on the couch watching something on TV while modeling, and and I'm not paying attention, and I'm off by a millimeter. Yeah. Um. So for this example, my and and sometimes things are just hard to measure. Um, yes. You're using a giant caliper in such a small fashion and trying to use depth to measure something where it needs to fit and it doesn't always work. Um, mm -hmm. So I will always just kind of go with my first one and then I measure how much I need to move something from there with yeah. the physical Does piece in my tight? hand. Does it fit loose? Exactly. Yeah. And um, just as a, as a, I'm wondering how how much accuracy do you go down to? Do you go down to a quarter millimeter or a tenth or what? So, with my let's with Rhino, you, you work on a grid. Um, I have my my points, my snapping points, um, to a sixteenth of a millimeter. That's so weird, dude. You know that's Why? weird, right? Yeah, but I don't like. I I I know. I my measurements, my 0.125, my 0.375, my 188s. I just, <laughs> it works out. Um, it's just so strange. And <laughs> it's, I think I think I started that mainly because tolerances. Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, it probably just worked out where, if I make up, obviously, well, so with 3D printing, FDM wise, it matters your print orientation. Yes. Um, so if I print is up on the printer. Yes. So if I print, let's just say a square and it's got a hole in it and I want to put a, a, a peg into that hole. Um, excuse me. I will print my peg sideways mm -hmm. and I will make it the same exact diameter as the hole. If my hole is going up and down. Mm -hmm. But if I print that part on its side, the, the part with the hole. So my mm -hmm. hole is on the side. Um, I usually do a, um, either a 16th of a millimeter gap or all around or an eighth of a millimeter. Yeah. And a, a, a tenth of a millimeter is about the thickness of a piece of paper to get yeah, an idea it's... for everybody about how accurate we're talking for getting these things to fit. Right. Yeah. And if you're not using paint and you're just going by the straight material, yeah, it all matters. Oh, um, yeah. And I'm still, when it comes to a peg, I know it's not going to be seen, so I'll sand it if I need to. Um, I'll change my print orientation, then I don't really feel like changing the model, so I'll just sand if I need to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, tolerances need to be tight for what I do. Um, so I, but I mean, for the most part, I'm sticking to half millimeters um, yeah. for my main block of a design. Cool. And it's definitely things that don't matter in the end. I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an overthought just due to the way my mind works and the little bit of OCD I've got. It's, I want things to all be lined up to this half of a millimeter, mm -hmm. but it, I'm never measuring my stuff when I'm done. Like it's never, it's more just, I know that it looks nice on the computer, but when I print it, it doesn't matter at all. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah and I also think it's in files that never show up in the final print. Yeah, and I think part of it too is because I've done so much of the reverse engineering, taking something and then making the 3D model of it, mm -hmm. I appreciate when somebody makes a surface detail one millimeter or 1.25 millimeters from the edge. Yep, that's one really so interesting thing that I've noticed is that when you start doing any amount of reverse engineering of anything, you start to appreciate when somebody made something like exactly 12 inches. Or like, like yes. And if it doesn't come out to like a, a even number of millimeters, well, is it an even number of inches? Like, what was it designed in? And you can kind of tell where that person's headspace was. Legos are not in any correct measurement. Nope, 
they are and it, some alien measurement system. It drives me crazy. So like, it's only happened a few times where I want to make something like a. Uh, there was a really cool um, uh, design someone made where it was like a, a robot, like frame, mm-hmm. and all the body parts were Lego studs. Oh yeah, I've seen those. Uh, I, but, I, yeah, I can't it, remember what it's called, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so I was like, okay, this is cool, but. I'm not going to be able to print it properly on my printer unless I cut things up. So I was like, this is simple enough. Let me just redesign the Lego brick. Mm-hmm. It didn't happen because no. it was like 1.2735 millimeters for the head, the, the stud. It was like, no, that's not working. Yeah, I, even I, if and you I, look I at, won't make it. <laughs> even if you look at the internal Lego design documents, they're not really specified. Like if you go online and look up the measurements of a Lego brick, there are like serious internet arguments about this stuff. Like it's bad. <laughs> and, uh, and it's funny how many knockoffs there actually are. Yeah. And, they're, and that's why they're all terrible because they, they yeah. don't have the magic numbers. Yep. <laughs> they don't yeah. fit together. Right. Um, yeah. And then, so, so what considerations do you make for 3d printing? Cause your stuff is all 3d printed, right? You're not going to injection molding or are you? Uh, not at the moment. I have, I think, one or two projects have been. Two projects have been uh, that were for a really, really tiny convention I was a part of <laughs> um, in Wichita, Kansas. I went to one, and then like the following two years, they uh, commissioned me to make something that was injection molded. Oh, that's cool. Uh, but it was a nightmare. It's tough. Yeah. Um. So designing for injection molding is miles different than 3D printing. Well, what considerations do you have for 3D printing? Uh, to be honest, maybe just small surface details. I just have to think about how deep they should be. Um, you, you print with a lot of supports though, right? Yes. Okay. I guess that's... Yeah. So I have... Um, when you have a printer, you need to fine-tune your settings and... Um, obviously trial and error i fine-tune my settings basically the exact way that i need them to be Mm -hmm. um so i'm not as limited as i used to be so like when i used to work at far i was printing everything in halves so i didn't have overhang to prevent Mm -hmm. support material um and support material is basically if you print a giant letter t those ends aren't going to print because they have nothing to print underneath of them they have nothing to support them um so with Cura and those slicing softwares, you have a bunch of parameters on how you want those supports to be printed. And um, a big issue that a lot of people have is you want your part, your supports to be um, close enough to your print to where you can, it the, the bottom surface will print fine, but not too close to where you can't pull it apart. Yeah. Um, if you're using the same material. Um, so I feel like I've got that magic number just right. Um, so I think for the most part, the things that I'm considering are just how easy those supports are going to be to take apart. And um, and uh-huh. a lot of different shapes I'm not going to print in one piece, not only because of um, print time or support structure, but just surface detail. Sometimes I know I'll get a cannon to print print nicer going vertically rather than horizontally Mm -hmm. um but then you run the risk of the breaking point the tensile strength um if you were to just print a cylinder straight up and it drives me crazy how many people print things that fit together with pegs and they print the pegs upright (laughs) they just snap off immediately yeah because the grain is horizontal so that's where you're gonna that's where it's gonna break if you put any kind of uh stress on it um so i think those are the main things that i consider um just what if i'm making parts that assemble where are my joints and how am i going to be able to orient them Mm -hmm. um you have a lot more freedom as opposed to injection molding where injection molding usually it's a two-part mold uh for more simple things where you need the part to be able to pull out of the mold um Mm -hmm. And that's where things can get a lot more complicated. Um, just simply basic design stuff. You need things designed at ang- at angles and um, open spaces for the material to flow through the yeah. 
the molds. Um, yeah, flat surfaces can't be flat. They actually have to be angled very slightly to kick yes. it out of the mold correctly. And that's part of a thing that I would drive me crazy is looking at my models in Rhino and seeing a line that is two degrees out. <laughs> it's like, I like seeing it clean on my grid. Yep. Yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah. Um, and so, no, I guess that's that's pretty much that's a pretty good description of your design method. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so you design almost entirely for filament printers, correct? Or do you still order out? No. Um, yeah. So I used to do Shapeways, um, and it was an online service that would print uh, with the uh, nylon powder. Um, but that was stupid expensive and mm -hmm. like most people who design things, you mess up the first few times. <laughs> yeah. Um, so having to wait and pay was just not in the cards. Um, and their tolerances were all over the place too. So what you think is going to come out perfectly on your fourth try, their tolerances or they, pr they orient your print at a slight angle and it messes everything up. Yeah. Um, things just got a lot more expensive. And I, when I was using Shapeways, I was still in college. I yeah. didn't have money. I, I was student loan money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but even now, yeah, I'm designing everything for, uh, for just my at home printing um, or a bit FDM printing. Basically I have one customer who prints the stuff that I designed for him himself. Mm -hmm. um, okay, cool. Yeah, I design most of my stuff for Thingiverse, and so my stuff is literally designed for like lowest common denominator printer. Yeah. So I make sure that you can print it at 0.2 millimeters. <laughs> uh, I make sure that like you can print without any supports on anything. Um, like very rarely do my prints require supports, uh, just because yeah. I know that a lot of people don't have it dialed in like that. Yeah, and that's the main reason why I have zero of my models on Thingiverse <laughs> or for sale, just the amount of, I don't think I have the patience to communicate enough or to design my models to where everyone would need to be able to print it properly. Oh man. I know it's a silly thing. I actually designed it kind of not on a dare, but somebody on Reddit asked me to design it, to, to design it, but go to Thingiverse and look at that um, snow blower that I have that thing is like oh, 20 billion parts oh that's nice that and the um oh what is it the the mad the big mad max truck thing are both just like a zillion little parts that have to be glued together yeah there's no way that I would and that's that's exactly so um have you played the game Titanfall no but I know what you're talking about I know what it is okay yeah so I I it's made like one dudes of those and mechs right yeah it's mechs but oh. super uh, not just mech assault, mech warrior mechs, but they've got big arms and a guy that goes in the chest and they've got big guns. Like they're ha holding guns like a Gundam. Um, yeah, they're more so, um, parkour mechs than mech warrior yeah. mechs. Yeah. So I designed one of those. Um, it's on my, my Instagram page and the hands alone have like 30 parts. Oh, geez. The, Cause I, I, it's got the, the three fingers and a thumb and they have three digits um Good so Lord. there is no like that that model itself has over 100 parts there yeah. is no way i'm putting that online for someone to say hey it doesn't work on my printer at 0.2 millimeters with no supports <laughs> can you edit the can you edit the file for me oh, no yeah. um so that's that's me just being blunt um and yeah. straightforward that, that i'm not I, I it's not something i have ever wanted to do um i would be more willing to print and sell the model itself yeah because then um, you can control the printing of it and the manufacturing of it yeah and i think it's it's a lot of i mean i take pride in my stuff i don't want someone who's just printing it and, and it looks like crap and doesn't show off what i put into it ah um because i know most people print at 0.2 millimeters my <laughs> models aren't designed at 0.2 millimeters in mind most most of the time at least so Especially with joints, joints are not going to work the same at point two as opposed to um, point point one two yeah. or point one eight or point oh eight. You know, it's yeah. I printed a handful of things at point oh five, and they are gorgeous, but it takes 
so forever. long. <laughs> like a Hot Wheels car sized <laughs> object took like ten or eleven hours. Yeah. I was like, and nah, then if man, you me- I'm good. <laughs> and then if you mess that up, you gotta yeah. reprint it. Oh yeah. <laughs> Especially it's with all the tolerance. To yep. Yeah. Um Yeah, it's definitely very, very special. So do you so when you're designing, do you you said you do not design for them to be painted? Did they stay gray, or do you paint them right at the end, or what? No, I just leave them gray. Okay, so like um, your finished toy is gray. You don't worry about it. Yeah, exactly. For I mean, because everything's personal. You know, it's just for me sitting on a shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, or Instagram. I I treat them as 3D prints. I like the way they look. The detail comes out. Um, not only that, but if i paint i'm gonna mess it up ah yeah um and and it's a simple thing of due to learning with all the when i was in high school painting toys that transformed yeah they scrape you're gonna off get, and get all janky. yeah paint rub is what they call it where an elbow you can't paint on the inside because the moment you bend it it's gonna scrape itself off. off on the ball um, yeah so i've got so much of that that i don't want a fully painted toy with gray elbows and gray everything, you know, like, yeah, especially because they are based on characters or you have um, to not articulate it, which doesn't sound defeats, like fun. Yeah. No. And, and also, I mean, I could, you know, I could spend the time and buy a bunch of different color filaments and print different colors. Yeah. That's one thing we right should color. note that we really haven't yet is that your print just comes out, whatever plastic color you put in um there's it's not magic it doesn't add ink to it or anything like that so Mm -hmm. your print either is the color you of the plastic you put in or you have to paint it afterwards yes uh yeah Uh, so i think it's just a financial thing i can do all my prototyping in one color and then say hey this looks good i'm done i can move on to the next project yeah um i don't want to have to do all my testing and then grab another roll of filament for four parts and then two parts and yeah and then your design and then you're also designing because if I do a a transformer that he has, like let's say a, a, a toy you buy in the store will have some paint apps on it, that means I have to print that at a different part. I have to design yeah. it as a different part. Um, That's just awful. Yeah, so I guess I, I would kind of treat my a lot of the things that I make as if they were going to be painted. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll have surface detail that might be a different color than the main body. Yeah, I was wondering um, if you like if you popped out into detail so it could be easily dry brushed or anything like that. So yeah, I, I I've done that for for customers for okay. one of the I've I've been working for this one guy for years, um, and he has me do that a lot on random things where I'll print some surface detail just a little bit higher or design it a little bit higher so he can dry brush. Um, yeah. But again, for me, it's there's almost no denying when you look at it in hand. Unless you spend hours surface treating it, sanding it, it still looks like a three D print. It still looks like a three D print. Yeah, and I don't think I I don't have the skill or the desire to spend that much time trying to smoothen every surface to where it doesn't look three D printed. Yeah, so yeah, I, I just like the look of it, Gray. A lot of um, yeah, it's funny. Even that like big five foot or four and a half foot or whatever she is um, sculpture that I did, you can still tell it's three D printed. Like. Even on something like yeah. that, from like ten feet away, you're like, "That looks wrong." Um, yeah, just something looks a little something off. Something about it, yeah. And there's something in um, in tabletop gaming, which is what I make a lot of my models for. So no articulation, but you're going to be handling them constantly. Yeah. Um, is that there? There's something referred to as table quality, which <laughs> is like it, it's usually used to describe like a quality of paint job. Like, it's not okay. going to be under a microscope. It's not going to be on the front of a, yes. of a product box. It just has to look good on the table when you're playing with it. Yeah. Like, think of, like, the, the art on a board game board. Like, it doesn't have to be perfect because you're not, like, scrutinizing it as a work of art. Um, yeah. And, so and that's all my prints. Yeah, it's the same thing. Like, so I just switched. The, one of my most recent pictures, I have a different material that I bought locally and it looks like resin gray from any distance oh, nice. or in pictures you can't see the layer lines yeah i've noticed that the the lighter than medium grays print and photograph just incredibly well yes um but yeah so from any picture you don't see it 
the layers yeah. don't look like they're there. But again, I'm handling these on a day to day basis. So I would you see him, you yeah, notice yeah, that it's well, reprinted. And and also when you're when you're in a certain ho- when you're in a certain hobby or use a certain tool, you get used to looking for the tool marks of that tool. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing I've actually gotten into recently that you should look at um, if you get a chance is to go through the Thingiverse stuff, the bases and the bottom edges of models. Now I've started to texture them just by like doing a tr- traditional model applied texture like just glue and then some material stuck to it mm-hmm. and it really helps it not look like a 3d print like even yeah. if there's exposed parts that are 3d printed for some reason like that bit of obviously not 3d printed texture just cleans it up and... well and i think that's just a, a a common thing with i mean if you have a, if you're designing something that's supposed to be textured yeah it works out wonders i mean i've seen um I, and I really want to do it now that we we found the game. We bought it. Well, we bought Catan, and a lot of people are three D printing yes. the actual plates. You just bought Catan, so Catan settlers. We've of only Catan. I don't. It's the same thing. Yeah. We've we've I've only played it twice, um, and we didn't want to spend fifty bucks when it's just me and Sophie here. We don't That's have fair. a group of friends that play it, and we found it at a. A thrift shop for five bucks oh, brand new man. that's amazing it was everything was so the box was open and i think somebody got it and was like i'm not putting this thing together <laughs> so everything was sealed inside and complete oh yeah um, if you want to hate your friends man Catan oh, do I, it. yeah we we ne- we definitely need a group to play with here yeah um, it's it's vicious in a lot of yeah. ways oh yeah but but yeah, you yeah, can so, print the cool little tiles for those. Yep. Yeah. That's what would be cool with having a, a multi-head printer. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that that whole oh, yeah, thing yeah. called get, or a pallet. Mm-hmm. Where you can put four materials in. Yeah, there are filament-based printers where you put multiple colors of plastic in. And by mixing the different colors of plastic, you can kind of do the same thing that you would well, with... A printer but it doesn't really sometimes it looks it's, good sometimes it doesn't it's more of so the, i think they're working on one that will actually like you put a cmyk filament oh, those are the ones that i've seen where they're okay, not cmyk so the one... but they're they're like solid they're more like crayon colors and then yeah mix them together they're not it doesn't but, mix great yeah so then there's another one where it's simpler but it's like you make a model that has four different colors mm-hmm. and Oh, that you just picks and chooses. Exactly. So okay, you use a different yeah. slicer, and you'll see there's like a giant block that it prints on the side, a tower that is where it's oozing out the remaining of that color, mm-hmm. and then prints the next few layers, the next it's, part of uh, that layer. What's that called? Color. It's a wipe pad, I think. Yeah, it's called palette. Yeah, yeah. And um, it just sits on the side, and you feed all your filaments into there, and it does all the work. Ugh, that's too much effort. I'll, I'll paint it before I do that. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking, too, is like, you it's cool but you can only get four colors and then you have to make your model in color yeah well i don't know if you have to do it in color but you'd have to at least designate which portions of it yeah that's no fun i don't want that and again i like gray (laughs) i'm good with gray so i I, I think a lot of for my stuff because it is going to be used in a game for tabletop stuff people are going to paint it whatever color that works with their stuff yeah, so, and I would say that's that's part of that hobby is yeah. painting. Like I, I I just finished the design for a fire truck that I I did in bright orange, which is not the mm-hmm. original color. The original color was like a fire truck red, and I know that people will use it as a camouflage military vehicle. Yeah, and exactly because it's just cool looking. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's funny. I I got um, speaking of like inspiration like where where you get your designs from um i was watching a tv show um out of the loop i think that's what it's called on amazon mm-hmm. it's simon stallenhog's art and they made a tv show out of it it's all this like weird sci-fi stuff you'd actually like it you'd, you'd like it cool. if you have prime uh-huh. you should check it out i think it's yeah. out of the loop um but in the background of like the first episode this weird truck drives by so then of course <laughs> i had to like <laughs> stop and Pause spend it. like and i think it took me like 45 minutes to find this truck because oh it's it's a it's not just a fire truck it's a fire truck that was only used in airports 
Oh, that's crazy. And so they made like 50 or 60 of these things ever, and they were British. So it's like finding this thing on the internet was nearly impossible, but I yeah. did find it, and I actually found a plan <laughs> for it so I could make a pretty accurate model of it. Oh, that's perfect. Yep. <laughs> Uh, but it was just funny that like this thing just rolled through the background of this scene. And I just had to have it. Boom. Well, I mean, it was. I mean, obviously not as intense. But Sophie was playing Animal Crossing, and knowing I like Transformers and robots, she's like, "Look, you can buy this big robot. You have to buy the <laughs> recipes for it." And I looked at it, and I immediately fell in love, and was looking for pictures all over the internet of that that exact robot. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely that... taken screenshots of videos, yeah. <laughs> and then laid them all out on a second monitor while I'm working. Reference sheet. Yeah. Yeah. That. Um, there's a snowblower that I did that that I referenced earlier, and that was actually much harder because there's there were no plans, and there's only like two or three extant photographs of uh, of of one of them oh, so i had to design it from like a three-quarter view and then like a kind of below side shot oh, oh. and so i had no top down no front no back none of the other See, side i just had to guess what was on the other side of the thing but what's nice about that is it, it's only for your sanity yeah <laughs> but you can you can edit it how you want because yeah. if there's no pictures nobody can prove you wrong <laughs> well and it's funny because like the original had some some engine i actually lo- i lo- actually lo- looked up what engine it had i just didn't like it so i just put this big like <laughs> i just put this big inline six in there and like did these very fancy exhaust that you'd see on like a formula car oh, totally cool. unreasonable for a snowblower <laughs> yeah. but hey, it looks cool but and it, it looks cool, cool. <laughs> and it prints right that's what's important yes um, exactly yeah it's it's funny where you get your ideas for stuff from um yeah it's just watching stuff i mean in the end video games anything yeah. nerd culture basically well and i think that's a that's a important thing to bring up is kind of the intellectual property a lot of the stuff that i do is from real life like i, I can redesign a truck and as long as i say it's a version of that truck or something-esque I can get away with posting that thing, especially if I'm yes. not if I'm just doing one that looks kind of like it, not an mm-hmm. exact replica. Um, yeah. How do you deal with that with your Transformers stuff? Do you just not bother because it's personal stuff, or where do you get into yes. it when you start selling things? So that's where, um, when it comes to, I mean, that's part of why I don't give up my designs anyway, because um, I'm sure I can make a decent amount of cash on. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. selling my models but that's a big portion because if obviously a few hundred dollars here and there they're not going to make a big deal but if Hasbro wanted to come after me if I'm selling Transformers yeah. they they're have the gonna. money to yeah. um, and I will say with Transformers a huge part of the of Transformers are third party companies that are almost directly stealing IP from from Hasbro, yeah. but they call it something different, yeah. And they don't make as big a production, so they're able to get away with it. And I've got tons of those sitting. I have a few knockoffs, um, <laughs> which is a is a moral question that I have to deal with every day as a designer. Um, <laughs> but um, when it comes to commissions, um, it's just a matter of altering. If they have me make something that's that has IP, that's from an IP. Um, it's just a matter of changing things up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that things are at a small scale. Um, these guys aren't making thousands of dollars. Um, they're putting a lot of work into it as well. Um, yeah. So I don't worry as much about those small things. I don't take a whole lot of commissions, though. I've, I've got two main customers that I work for. Um, mm-hmm. One of them I've been dealing with for years, and we make a lot of Kingdom Heart type things. I've made probably 30 Keyblades. <laughs> um, a lot of transformer stuff um, and I'm not making a whole lot on them not only because it was my first commission so I didn't know how to price things at the time yeah. um, and I honor because it's a I've clearly worked for the guy for three years and all of my toys that are my thousands of dollars worth of toys are thanks to him yeah. um, the other guy I've only done a few projects for but again it's it's for his personal collection um uh, that that's so, kind of nice you don't have to worry about it getting out in the world yeah and and th- for that guy i actually the guy i've worked for for three years he about a year ago bought his own printer so he now prints 
my stuff. Um, That's nice. But the other guy, I print for him. And just mail it to him? Exactly. Yeah. So it's kind of that one step removed. Like, I'm basically the money I get is going into my time and effort toward the design. It's going to printing cost. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the end, it's, I mean, it's a hobby in the end. Like I, I don't need this for my, my job that any money that I get goes into my PayPal and that goes straight into my, my hobby back I'm into it. More toys. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. So for the most part, I just don't take a whole lot of commissions and I don't put myself out there as much. Um, and I think part of that too is because I, as much as I can do at home, I do want to learn more on the, the full grand scheme of things when it comes to toy design. Mm -hmm. Um, so working for a toy company is the dream job. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just try to play it safe knowing one day I'll get there. Yeah. You got a cool Um, gig in the meantime, uh, and good hobbies to get you there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the 3D printing stuff in the news. That's right now. Um, there's all the 3D printing of the face masks and accessories to deal with all of the virus death and destruction um, and the lack of supplies for said destruction. Um, yes. Have you been doing any of that? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just, I haven't really, I mean... I know a lot of people are doing them for their work, but mm-hmm. my work does 3D printing and they're doing a lot already. Um, so <coughs> I think it's just been a matter of I haven't gone out of my way to look for people who need it and I haven't yeah. been asked. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Um, yeah, we went out of our way because just for where we live, we know that a lot of the healthcare stuff around here is not great, not well supplied. So yeah, I'm trying to do and that I thing. think part of us for a part for me too is lack of supplies mm-hmm. um there is a micro center nearby but when i went a few weeks ago they were really low on filament and um online mm-hmm. takes forever to buy it yeah if you've um, noticed even, even, a- uh, amazon's pretty much out right now i'm not sure who you use but who do you use for yeah filament? uh for pla i was using hatchbox okay that's what i use yeah um or overture I tried yeah. Overture out, and they were really good. Um, but for ABS, I will go back to my old brand, which is um, Octave for ABS. But I, the, what do you call it? Um, the Micro Center, they sell um, Inland. Yeah. For I've, I've used cheap. Inlands before, and it's okay. Yeah, I've never used it. This is my first time. Um, and that's what this ABS that I'm using is, and it's working nice, but I think I prefer the lighter lighter yeah. gray color. Yeah, it's a funny thing of trying to find exactly the right color. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I I can't speak too much, but I've been it's super impressed with the amount that some people are, are printing this stuff out. Um, I'm, I'm in part of a few Facebook groups for 3D printing and it's like 85% of people are just nonstop. If they've got more than one printer, yeah, it's just running constantly printing out the face shields. Yeah. Mine pretty much run all the time, except when I'm doing these interviews. Um, <laughs> and first thing in the morning before I walk over here and restart the next print for the day. That's cool. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's a great thing. I mean, even at my work, they've been printing out little door hooks for yep. people to carry around. Um, and then, of course, you see the occasional Darth Vader mask that sits on top of someone's respirator. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that I've been thinking about is that we've been um, also sewing some of the cloth mask things, but I really mm-hmm. want to do some like higher fashion ones of those. Um, cool. Oh, and so also, you guys have course... been make, making... Oh, go, go what'd you say? You guys are actually making the, the cloth mask? Yeah. Yeah, because um, Elizabeth sews, so we've been doing that too. Oh, that's nice. Um, and it's a little bit more hands-on than the 3D printed stuff, which is just like set the printer and walk away. Yeah, um, exactly. But yeah, so I, I actually want to make some accessories so it's a little bit more acceptable for me to wear my cartridge masks out. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I mean, tons of people are doing them already, so yeah. it's not like I'll you wouldn't something. have a template. Yeah. 
because the cartridge yeah, they... masks so far i've not seen too many people out and about with those but i far prefer them from a safety standpoint yeah i actually just saw some guy with one and it was like kind of sketchy because but obviously he's just trying to do his part yeah but he was like an old dude with like biker leather pants a leather jacket like the or a leather vest <laughs> and awesome. then he had this like really industrial big black uh face mask on well it's funny because i actually have one of the full face glass ones like one of the ones that covers your whole head and i really want to wear that that one out but that that's just for like when i was painting the house i bought that one Um, well so but it would be hilarious to wear that out at at my work because we deal with oh wait give me one second oh yeah the fine particulate of titanium right um yeah so we wear what's called a papper unit Mm -hmm. um because of all the fine powder, so we're not Positive breathing air in. pressure respirator, right? Uh, probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we just call it our pappers. <laughs> um, but that, that that makes sense. Yes. Um, we'll go with that. But yeah, it's it's basically just a, a, a space helmet. Yeah. That has a, a a tube in the back and a fan around our waist. Yes, then that's a um, positive air pressure one. So we joke around about just taking that around everywhere. Yeah. Um, but we wear those most of the day, anyway. Yeah, um, you get used to it eventually. Yeah, and it's funny because they gave us someone we're not wearing one of those. Where, um, we don't have to wear the papper. Uh-huh. So now, because of the whole issue, is they gave us these. Um, and they're basically like you know people go skiing. They have that little tube. Uh-huh. It's like a, a, a whatever a cloth. Um, a ball of mask. lava. Yeah. So we wear one of those now around the office, and oh, it gets cool. so hot. Oh yeah. So we prefer to just walk around in our PAPR units, <laughs> even if we can That's barely so understand funny. each other. <laughs> yeah. You got to get the little sub vocalization mics so you can, <laughs> yeah. you can talk a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, one thing I, I know that we were both kind of, uh, we both get a lot and I think is one of those things that's just fun to complain about, but um, all of the, I'm not going to say dumb questions. It's we'll call it ignorant. All of the difficult questions, <laughs> which are easy, but yes, <laughs> yeah, which are easy answers, but just mm, pain. <laughs> the painful questions. There we go. That's better. Yes. Um. So I think that starting with this whole three D printing for the crisis thing, I think that's a good place to start. In that, um, a lot of people look at it as this like end all solution for this problem, but it's yes. not. What are you playing with? Oh, don't worry about it. Are you cutting something? Stop that. <laughs> no, it's a something with a ratchet. Sorry, oh, I'm just I'm just fiddling, and it's got a ratchet joint. <laughs> well, ratchet silently. Um, I put it away. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one thing that I have an issue with with the 3D printed stuff is because of the low temperature plastics that we're using for all this stuff, you can't heat treat any of these things. So you can't really sanitize them through heat. You have to sanitize them through some sort of chemical pro- process. And when it's hard to get like Clorox wipes and Clorox, that becomes yep. a big, big problem. And it's really frustrating for people to not understand that it's not the solution for everything. And I think that's probably the core of a lot of these dumb questions is that but people I will, just don't I will get say, that it's the end all be all. It's a, good, mean, yeah. it's a good halfway measure. Don't get me wrong. People do think it, but um, just on a side note, can't because I've been seeing a lot of people talk about um, using a black light. Yeah, so you kill. can use ultraviolet to kill. But the problem with that is then the the fact that three D printing has voids in it causes problems. Yes. There's negative yes. spaces between the layers, which add shadow, which make space for things to live. Um, yes. And so a lot of these methods, it's actually really hard to clean a 3D printed thing up to the point of being medical grade uh, well, because you just can't do it. And um, in all honesty, you're not going to the I think the number one mistake and it's something I've learned because I have a beard. Yeah, it doesn't seal well anyway. It doesn't seal at all. Yeah. So even if you have a mask on and you have facial hair, like so due to the job, we used to... Um, when I was doing more of the post-processing um, part of my job, we would have to wear just like you know a half mask, um, mm-hmm. like a painter's respirator. Yeah. Um, so we had to get an annual test if you used one. So I had to shave my beard, uh-huh. and I had shaved the night before with a blade, not against the grain, but still. 
<laughs> the next the next morning they told me you are barely passing this exam oh jeez. so you, you they i asked her like well what do i need and she says you need to have a clean shave bare skin every morning to get a proper seal yeah so one thing i've actually heard is that people will use um vaseline on their beards and that <sighs> makes a proper seal and you just gotta I mean, wash it out at the end of the day i guess you're I mean, I, I, it's probably just more of you're hoping you get a proper seal. No, no, that's that's the thing to do, is you, you essentially so fill your beard with Vaseline and then yeah. shove it against your face and it seals it. It's gross. It probably feels disgusting, but it works. Yeah, um, with, with there being a, a no clear end to this, I'd rather just shave. Yeah. <laughs> if, that's my, if that's my only solution. Yeah, that's fair. Um, but yeah, going back to the printing stuff, um, like anything medical grade is silly. Like we don't in the house, we don't even use 3d prints for cooking. No, um, no, no, not at all. Like we, yeah, we'll, no food we'll, grade. Do, we'll do cookie cutters, but we use it once and then toss it. Um, yeah. Cause you'd have to, I mean, even if you got a, a toothbrush, you're still running the risk of stuff getting inside. Yep. Yeah, and if like oh. if you if you dunk it in water, then you have the issue that it can literally get inside the print and go yeah. stagnant, um, and that causes I, all sorts of problems. Your I guess your only real solution would be because there are smootheners for yeah. You you could just I mean, coat it. Yes, exactly, and I mean, but the the any day person like we said they're they're gonna expect it to. Yeah. Oh, we can three D print anything. Why can't you just three D print a mask? Perfect, it works. Yeah. No. no. No, it doesn't. Yeah, that was that was one thing I was seeing for a little while where on Facebook and one of those groups and it was immediately shut down because some people, even if they do 3D print, are not smart enough yeah. <laughs> to realize yeah. that. So they were printing a flat sheet, like a, a sheet mm -hmm. with a specific hatch mark to it and yeah. expecting that to work. To be a filter. And it's like, no. And they were just going to flex it like they'd use TPU print, uh, uh, like a flexible material and just flex it over their face. Mm -hmm. it's like just because you have 3d printing doesn't mean it's the most effective yeah you can't print a filter guys please yeah. stop no. um yeah it's just not the solution for everything all right so what are the other what are the other misconceptions or you know issues that we have with this thing that it still exists you know 10 years after it's become pretty yeah. much public knowledge <laughs> I mean, you you get the cool stuff like the house, people printing houses. Oh, you can live in a 3D printed house, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and then there's, get... and then actually the funny thing is the same issues come up. You have layer lines. Yep. The prints are stronger along the layer than they are between la la layers. Mm -hmm. And concrete has the exact same problems that, that plastic does in that regard, where it's just not going to fly. Like it's being a, somebody who does a lot of construction stuff just for fun, like two by fours and uh, cinder blocks are really good stuff and super cheap. And and, and rebar, yeah, yeah. <laughs> something to support it. Yeah. Um, and which I of think, course, using it as a a supplementary thing, adding it to a a process is fine. Oh yeah, it's great. Like as we talked about earlier, we make lots of brackets for other stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and 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 jigs like i when i did the the kitchen in in this house um all of the door handles where i put like the screws in i 3d printed a little box jig that just went in the corner and i dropped a drill through it um yeah. because it was just more perfect than any other way i could do it um yep. and so little stuff like that is definitely definitely good but it's very frustrating to see the the 3d printed house stuff and everybody's like oh all, all our houses are gonna be 3d printed it's like no and even if they are, like, I have a big issue, and I think you probably do to a certain extent as well, of we're both very hands-on kind of people. Yeah. And watching a million-dollar robot build a house where generally it would be, like, ten guys with a lot of hand skill building that house. Yes. It's like, well, you just <laughs> took all the money away from those ten dudes that can build that house way better, faster. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and yeah. keep the money in the local economy as opposed to giving it to whoever built that robot. <laughs> And then have the robot crash and fail halfway through. Yeah, and those of us that are used no to 3D to printing. <laughs> yep, that's... <laughs> no one refilled its little hopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just kept printing the house with nothing coming out. Or the slicer didn't work quite right. Now you have yeah. a solid house. <laughs> Good luck uh, destroying that piece of concrete. Yeah, um, not enough infill. Not enough infill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, what else? What else? I'm trying to think of uh, all the others. I mean, the gun. The gun situation. All right, so why is the gun... Why is people the gun wanna, stupid? Because 
people think, oh, I can just 3D print a gun and it's untraceable and I can do whatever I want with it. But you, 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 you can to an extent. But it's just like, I guess it goes to what I consider, like my whole viewpoint about 3D printing when I print my stuff is it's a prototype. You don't ever want your finished product that's a functional product to really be 3D printed if you're, especially if it's got motion and combustion in it. Yeah. Um, so yes, people have been able to make a 3D printed gun and they'll get two shots out of it and then it melts or explodes. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then that's you get to start from square one. <laughs> that, that's the thing that I kind of joke with when people ask me about it because that's, I, I do a lot of like recruitment trips and things like that. And, um, uh, like whoever, like the school resource, uh, officer guys will always come up and be like, Hey, what about the 3d printed guns? And I'm like, do you still want your hand? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> it's essentially like holding a firecracker. It's, it, uh, it's, there's just, there's the only, I mean, obviously there's the criminal fact of it. You can yeah. have an untraceable gun and that's But honestly, fun. it's so freaking da- dangerous. Um, it's but it, it I mean in all honesty if someone's silly enough to do it let them do it and they'll learn their yeah, lesson jeez um, um it's just dumb yeah, it's very dumb um what else what are the other problems I mean it's not much of a stupid question but it's just a common question as everybody telling me oh do you know that they're printing uh the hearts and stuff now yeah. And like if you get in, if you have a heart attack, they can just print you a new one. Now this is a really interesting thing because they're not actually printing the tissue in most of those cases. Uh, yeah, they're printing it's... the scaffold and then just kind of growing the tissue in place. But they can't print anything as complicated as a heart. They can't even print striated muscle. Like the muscle can't be directional yet. Um, like yeah, they can't even just... do livers where you have to have like large veins and the the liver tissue. Uh, it has to be simple stuff like an esophagus, which is essentially one material in a tube. Yeah, um, and, and I think it's still the same situation of all 3D printing for the most part has the same flaws of the layer lines yeah. of things being able to pass through them. Yeah, it's like it just it just wouldn't work like an organic solid shape. Yeah, I think it's it runs into that. Um technological issue that i think all technologies have where that technology is the solution for everything and then it takes about 20 years for everybody to chill out yes <laughs> let it not be the solution and just be useful kind of like yeah, the, inter- the-, the internet was going to solve everything and then everybody got a little disillusioned and then we ended up just using it for pictures of cats and memes i know that's that's my favorite thing yeah. to see that like meme of i don't even know who it is but saying how i can't wait to see what they do with the internet in 30 years oh god and then it's an idiot with like a a, a cat meme, yep. <laughs> stupid stuff that I am a part of yep. <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah, I think uh, I think the problem with three D printing is that people like you and I who have been doing it for a while, um, and there's people who have been doing it way longer than us. Like the the first course. patents for three D printing are 1978 from University yeah. of Texas, I think. Um, so it's been around for a while. Yeah, um, I think pro mainstream and economic or, or and, and academic mainstream has probably been mid aughts onwards and then public facing probably 2011 2012 ish onwards yeah that sounds about right yeah it's, it's about there but i think there's still a lot of mystique and mystery to it and yeah. um it, i think it's frustrating when you're in it and you realize that this is just a table saw or it's just a drill <laughs> yeah right it's just that yeah, it, it, it's not magic just a, another part of the the whole thing that you're whatever you're making you just use it as a tool yeah it's just one of the tools in the process it's cool it's super fancy but it's hard to design for and it is definitely limited in its scope and it, i in all honesty it probably takes more time to understand than any other tool Oh, just because yeah because um, it's not it's 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 not only like i can learn a table saw and i can make a really cool piece of yeah. furniture but you have to learn how to work a computer software and a slicing software and run the printers and, figure, and then and then yeah do the, your normal upkeep on your printer and you have to understand that you have to do that stuff which mm-hmm. i will just say the guy who i 
do the commissions for when he bought his printer that was the first thing i told him was it's gonna be more work than you think yeah like you get the finished product after i spend hours fine-tuning my settings i need you to understand that if i'm still gonna work for you you're gonna have to do some work yeah that's something that um it's kind of funny and one of those issues with with academia of teaching students how to do this is that you almost want one printer for every student and nobody else is allowed to touch their printer yes. because you like become intimately knowledgeable about what that printer wants needs where it's going to screw up yeah and it doesn't even what... matter if it's you know 10 of the exact same printer they're all going to have something just a little bit different it's going to um, be put together with that that belt being held a, a quarter of an, a millimeter off the side, and yeah, yeah or, or yeah. the bed is slightly warped, or a you know millimeter thinner shave, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and that I think that's all it comes down to in the end is for people like me and you have been printing for years. It's like we understand the concepts of three D printing and three D modeling. Yeah, and how finicky the I, machines are. I couldn't imagine learning one or the other without the other, you know, like knowing how to model for the machine. And like, this is just a common issue that most businesses have where you have an engineer and you have the person running the machine as two separate people. Never the twain shall meet. Yeah. So it's like, I've learned from myself being, doing both, how beneficial that is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and that's something I I would really suggest for people who have any interest in getting into either part of this. Just go ahead and get into both parts. Yeah, Um, exactly. It'll make your life better and easier. Even if you're using Tinkercad, use use the most basic of softwares. Just learn. I think an educator license of Rhino is only like 100 or 200 bucks, something like that. Mine was 200. It's probably intimidating at first. Yeah, I don't know. It makes sense. Like, I, I just feel like it makes sense, but that's probably just because I've been staring at, at it for 10 and years. It makes sense to you and to me because you've been teaching artists yeah, who've already, yeah. but they've already been exposed to Illustrator. Yeah, they know what that looks try, like from a. Uh... Try to teach someone who's used to working Microsoft Paint when they were seven. I bet I could do it. Yeah, make it a challenge. <laughs> uh, it would be this definitely is why, much This is more why I didn't. This is why I couldn't I couldn't do the teaching. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it works. It works. We'll get there. Uh, we'll get everybody there. Uh, <laughs> so, anything else on the weird or irritating stuff or things that you just mm. that just don't work? I'm trying to think of because there's just so many questions that I get asked day to day, and I'm just like, nope, nope. Yeah, it's also a weird thing for me now because I work in an environment of 3D printers. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm in the same boat as everyone else. I don't really get the day-to-day questions as often. I used to, but I don't remember as much. Yeah. I think that's pretty much... You know, it just can't make everything, guys. It makes plastic tchotchkes. Yes. And yeah, and and that's... I think that... So one of my coworkers, he um, is going to be buying a printer soon with his dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's he's worked in... His dad owned a machine shop, and he's worked on... Um, oh, yeah. So if you're used to that, machine. a 3D printer is not much. Exactly, but I told him so they can do. His dad can do the programming for for CNC mills all day, mm-hmm. um, and he's catching on to it. Obviously, he's run that stuff his whole life, basically. Um, but I told him that if you guys get a printer, you need to learn the three D modeling. Yeah, or else you're going you're gonna to be sitting frustrated. around, or you're going to be sitting on Thingiverse all day printing out random tchotchkes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and not, and, and at the very minimal bit of it do it for for fun like you can only have so much fun printing other people's stuff you're eventually going to say what if this had this instead yeah and then you either have to learn the software and do it or you have to pay somebody about a hundred dollars an hour to do it for you yeah Yeah. um Yeah. yeah it's definitely uh one of those things that is for fun and for making your own tools but not really for profit there's a few people that make good money doing it, but I don't think I'm up for that kind of stress. No, and and that's I think that's my biggest thing. Like one of my other coworkers, the one who got the Elegu Mars, like his whole plan is to have a print farm, and Mm-mm. he's into Bit Bitcoin and all that stuff. So he oh. wants to do a big Bitcoin art because it's a thing that rich people like. Weird. Um, 
but yeah, and and to me that would make sense if you've got one product and and he's also an artist, so he would do other stuff. But one main product and you've got fifteen machines running at all times. Yeah, then you but might make then, a few bucks. Just, yeah, that that doesn't sound like what I want to do with my time. It, and and that's what it is for me. Like. I've barely got any time in my day already, mm-hmm. and I like toys, so why not just, <laughs> just spend a, toys, a few hours happy. a day? Yeah. And, yeah, make some toys. This is what makes me happy in the end, and yep. call it that. So looking towards uh, the future, what are you looking forward to? Either Well, let, well let's do, what are you looking forward to technology-wise? What's the next thing on the horizon you see that you're like, that's what I want? I mean, at this point, it's probably just a resin printer. <laughs> as simple as, as, as that as Would that you prefer is, a can... resin printer over the laser center nylon? Um, I think I would. But obviously, I don't have a resin printer to know how durable the stuff is. Yeah. Um, But I don't like the finish from the nylon as much. Oh, that like kind of matte finish? The, well, it's grainy. Yeah. It doesn't make a perfect face. Um, mm-hmm. which is, I think my, that was my issue with Shapeways because you can paint it, but, and sort of fill in those little rough textures. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the, the, um, resin is probably going to, at least for the look, the appearance, the feel, that's probably your best bet, mm-hmm. um, before you get into injection molding. Yeah, I agree. Oh. Um, the resin printers are very attractive surfaces. Um, yeah. Especially think, now that they get to nicer materials, I think it'll be better. Yeah, I think that now that the resin printers are more on the consumer um, price range, you know, like more people at home are printing on them, mm-hmm. it's just going to bump up the quality. People are going to want more, strive for more, do more, mm-hmm. um, get that quality a little higher. Uh, because no matter what, injection molding is always going to be stupid expensive. Yeah, yeah, it just and, has to and be. It, yeah, and it's design wise, it's a whole thing. It's it's a giant machine. It's and resin casting is slow and expensive. Yeah, and I think for my personal purpose, I'm fine. I think it's nice that I buy toys also because I know I can always get something better and fill that void. What I'm doing is filling another void that I know I'm okay with it being 3D printed. Yep. So it's like I have a little bit of both. I'm satisfied with that. I don't need to be producing the exact toys that I want on the shelf. Yeah. Because chances are I'm not going to be able to get them anywhere near as nice as I would want them so I can leave the big companies up for that. Yeah, that makes good sense. Um, And then uh, personal projects, what you looking forward to? What's on the horizon for you? Or what do you want to do more of, even though you haven't? Well, so I'm I'm just happy to getting to be getting back into it. I've been on a big lull lately, um, and I think it was a lot of I didn't have the ABS plastic going, and I knew I didn't want to be printing any more of PLA, knowing it wouldn't last. So I was waiting to mm-hmm. get my ABS set up. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got a few little projects. I mean, I just printed a Mega Man thing. Um, a, a character from a Mega Man game or mm-hmm. TV show, actually. Um, and literally, like an hour ago, somebody asked if I could make something else from Mega Man, which oh, sounds awesome. cool. It's like a mech that Mega Man sits into. Oh, that's um, cool. Uh, what well, I had, I have a, li- I always have a running list of things or pictures. Um, but I mean, I'm I'm constantly working on multiple things. Um, yeah. There's a few Star Wars droids that I want to tackle. Um, it's a lot of those we would know or really obscure ones well so there's one that I'm reworking Uh, it's a pit droid from um, it's technically from the cartoon that's what the style that I based Mm -hmm. the model off of I have it It, it's on my Instagram Um, okay but it's a it's it's the pit droid from the from the pod racers in episode one oh awesome Um, okay cool yeah those weird little Uh, tan things right yeah, exactly. Okay. So there was one character in the cartoon, and it just had a different little style to it. Um, so I've made one of those, but I'm reworking some of it for ABS. Um, there's honestly a few projects that I, um, I'm waiting on parts for, and it's more of a kit bash. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of like take an existing toy and add some parts to it. 
um, and they're Star Wars clones. So the new there's a TV show out right now, and they've got some clones with some different paintings, different little armor parts. So have you made Baby of... Yoda's little egg hover chair? Uh, no, I did print a Baby Yoda, and I have it at work. <laughs> it's a little handout. Um, see, and that's that's one of those things where I wanted to make it, and then all of a sudden my the company that I mainly buy from Bandai is producing mm. the Mandalorian toy and with yeah. the little baby Yoda and the cradle. So that was a pre-order instantly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people did that. Yeah. So that, I think that's part of it too. It's like the, the stuff that I would go out and buy is a different property than what I would make for the yeah. most part. Yeah. That makes good sense. And, and I, I can't design humans. I can't design yes, characters. From I definitely Star will go Marvel. buy figures that are people because I do not wish to design them. Exactly. And I think that's part of, so when, when I lived in Tallahassee and was in school and worked for you, it was like Transformers, Transformers, Transformers. Mm -hmm. Now it's more Marvel, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. So my collection isn't as I've, sold a lot of my transformers which has been nice because then i can make a lot of stuff i don't have to worry about buying transformers when i can yeah. make some but, but then i'll just buy the human characters um yeah <clears throat> yeah so that's an interesting thing that i've done is with with getting back into the tabletop stuff a lot as i've split it out in things that i absolutely cannot make i buy that stuff and exactly anything that i can make i kind of that's my cost of being in the hobby is I will make all the rest of the stuff. Yeah. So if I can make it, I will make it. And that's the, that's my like motivation for buying all the crap that I don't need that I want. Yeah. And even if, I mean, chances are you're going to spend more time and money in making it than you would buying it. Oh yeah. But it's way more fun. Exactly. And it's <laughs> that's, that's, and, yeah, exactly. And you were able to change that little freckle that you didn't like. You can remove it. <laughs> yep. Ugh. Seven Gatling guns on this car. Ooh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. I think that that takes us pretty much to the end. Um, is there anything else that you want to say to, to new people who might be getting into this or just listening to this for the first time? Or um, think we covered it? Well, I'll give a general a little bit. Take what Wyndham says, listen to him, but don't <laughs> let him don't let him change your mind on anything. <laughs> he he can be a jerk, but he knows what he's talking about most of the time. I'll Thanks. say that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, no, I mean I can just give you a general big thank you. Um that you've pushed me in the you've literally put me in the place that I wanted to be. Well awesome, um, man. And thank you for I coming know, on tonight. Yeah. Thank you for asking me. No, it means yeah. a lot. Um, Even though you're playing with a car in the background, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> These the, the microphone's really good, I guess. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, but yeah. Um, again, I I just want to thank you because you right. put me in. The, like I said, you put me in the place that I wanted to be when I needed it the most. Um, awesome. Well, it's good to talk to you again about this stuff. Yeah. I think it's good for other people to kind of hear that it can go a different way and you can yeah. have a good arts career doing your stuff because i think a lot that of isn't a lot art. of our students get frustrated that like arts has to be i'm going into animation or i'm painting or i'm doing ceramics yeah no sometimes you can make weird parts for transformers and that's totally cool <laughs> yeah and and even if it doesn't end up with a career in that exact thing you've got the skill on how to make something yeah and in all honesty, for people who are art majors, I'm sorry to tell you, but chances are you're not going to do exactly the thing you want. No. But your portfolio will show that you have the ability to learn yeah. to do what you want. And, and then it's just a matter of getting close. Yeah, exactly. And then you'll work your way to where you want to be. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again for coming on tonight. It was awesome. Um, put this up quickly. Uh, all right. Talk to you later. Yeah. Talk to you later. Thanks again.